I'm about to enter the United States Military Working Dog National Monument. And this monument was signed into law by Congress with legislation that passed through the House and Senate and signed into public law by the President of the United States. What these animals have provided for the military is a debt that I don't know that we'll ever be able to repay. Regardless of what kind of feelings you have for that animal, regardless of, of what kind of bond you have for that, that animal, if you're like, hey, no, I don't feel comfortable sending the dog, well, if the commander's like, well, if, well we're gonna send people, it's like the, the dog's gotta go. These dogs have saved countless thousands of American lives on the battlefields, protected American equipment, airfields, ammo dumps, supply depots, train depots, wherever we had military deployed, these dogs were there. You know, you're walking on total darkness. There's not a street light, there's not a, all you got the stars and, and or a moonlit night. So you, you're totally dependent on this animal. You know, they were scout dogs, sentry dogs, tracker dogs, mine and booby trap dogs. They were pulling sleds. They were messenger dogs. They did all kinds of different work. They even laid wire in the trenches. They trained the dogs at Camp Carson. They went with the dogs to Korea. They were together from beginning to what they believed would be the end. I saw the value in these dogs. I saw the lives that were saved. I saw dogs killed and in turn knowing that brothers, fathers, sons would be coming home to their families. The government treat, treated them as equipment and uh, we, we treated them as, uh, as our partners, our, our lifesavers. I don't exactly understand how it all happens, but they become part of you. So much to the extent, you know, at least for me when I cast them off, I sit there and say, God, bring him back. Throughout history, dogs have accompanied man at work and play. Even during wartime, dogs have played vital roles to save lives on the battlefields throughout the world. In this series, we look at the roles dogs perform in support of our ground troops. The bonds that's built in training gets solidified in the battlefield. And unless you've actually done it or experienced it, you don't understand it. You have a dog that did eight combat deployments. He did Silver Star Medal Honor recipient stuff night in and night out. He apprehended bad guys with weapons in their hands. He took beatings for you uh, when he got on bites. He found bombs. He roped out of helicopters. I mean, this dog was everything that should be talked about. I mean, the dogs were trained to do any number of things, of course, um, not just finding drugs per se, but finding bombs as we go into Afghanistan and Iraq, IEDs. Uh, they can sniff out these items. It can be used on stairwells, it can be used in deep hallways, it can be used in tunnels, bunkers. The need to have dogs that were explosively imprinted and that would interdict humans just exploded. These four-legged dogs, are absolutely, you know, to me, uh, the biggest combat multiplier we have out there. They can detect rust that's been painted over. They can detect cancer in humans. They can detect tremors. You know, what else can they detect? It's up to us almost to decide what they can't. It's not like your friendly little dog in the house. It's a dog that protects your life and you protect his life. This is a dog that will go to the nth degree for you. And that's the reason you get so damn close to them. You will hear firsthand stories from veteran war dog handlers about the roles their heroic dogs played to save their lives and the lives of others under extreme conditions. The role of the dog in special operations has evolved in such a way where in the beginning, men would say, uh, we're not sure you're ever gonna do this, to just six or eight months later, no one wanted to go into a house without a special operations canine. We were using all types of dogs, where German Shepherds, Collies, even Great Danes, but they didn't work out. Their other fellow soldiers did not really respect the dog handlers, and they were laughed at. 
It wasn't really until the Battle of Guam when the Marine Corps units, the dog units, really proved themselves in being able to detect the really entrenched Japanese soldiers in these jungles. We made the decision to specialize in German Shepherd dogs. We found them easier to train, that if they attack someone, they had the advantage, the dog had the advantage. So I got up to start moving into the alert again, and about that time, the ambush opened up. They knew that scout dog was on point, they knew that scout dog had them, and they knew that something was gonna come from the sky in not too long a period from that time the scout dog went down. Point man is the tip of the spear, period, in a jungle that you can't see more than 10 feet ahead of you. And the enemy's always there. It's losing a family member, a working friend that you got for life in a way because your day, day by day in Vietnam is life each day. And Chico alerted, and to this day, uh, it was one of those alerts like, how did I even notice this? It was so faint. And I said, Chico just alerted, but I, I'm not sure about this. I said, whatever it is, we're right on top of it. When your scout dog has an alert, don't doubt the dog. Never doubt your dog. When Diablo was on point, he never lost a man. My entire tour of duty. The two guys came back and they said, no 10 feet, you and probably 20 other guys would be dead. There was trip wire. And so I think Chico, I don't think he saw it. I think he smelled from them setting the trip wire the night before on the explosive. I woke up 20, 30 feet away from the blast site, propped up against the wall. And um, when, I, when I came to, uh, Benno was punching me in the face with his nose because we were attached to each other. And uh, I remember I woke up and I just, you know, in shock almost, and I grabbed his ears and out loud I looked and I was like, well, I got both my arms. Most of the scout dogs were the ones that really turned the war around on the North Vietnamese and they realized it. We knew we were being hunted, literally, so they started sending snipers after them. So they put a price tag on their head. So we had to deal with not only walking point, but do and know that we're being hunted at the same time. One time he called. He was hurt. He was mad. He was angry. The mission that went out, he lost a life. He said, Mom, he said, if Lex had been there in front of them, that Marine would not be gone right now. I said, son, I said, you can't stay out there 24-7. Dustin and Lex were hit 21 March 2007. Nine months later, we adopted Lex. It was like Lex was my dog, was, was our dog, like we had always been a part of each other's life. There can be miracles that come out of ashes and that's the way I feel. You'll hear heart-wrenching stories of dogs who lost their lives in battle and how it forever scarred the heart of their handler, and stories of the many dogs who were insensibly left behind when the wars were over. From, I say, 06 to 2010, which was a really bad war years, uh, men were getting killed in action. Dogs were getting killed in action. We were just, every mission, there was a canine. We had a dog named Roscoe, who was a Mao, who was tremendous. We had a, a big Dutch Shepherd, big 70-pound Dutch Shepherd named Rocky, who just did unbelievable work, engaged multiple bad guys, and was killed in action. Uh, we had another dog, Rudy, um, and Rudy was this big-headed Malinois who did really, really good stuff, um, bit, you know, I, I think probably 50 or 60 terrorists easily found, you know, at least a dozen explosives. We lost a lot of dogs to, to combat. And, and a lot of them, and the majority of them were, were gunshot wounds. They were GSWs. And that meant that a dude, an operator, was in close, close quarters battle with a bad guy. You know, they were going into harm's way and dogs were getting shot. We put our dogs in body armor. Some guys had, a, they all had a vest. They all had this really cool Gucci camera. 
Um, they all had a, a, a way. We, we just thought that we had to protect them. From the cold, wet beaches of Normandy to the muddy ice fields of Korea, steamy jungles of South Vietnam, hot, dry desert of Iraq, and the mountains of Afghanistan, these dogs have bravely served our country. They have protected us on the battlefield, and they watch over us with eternal rest. I think it's an age-old debate and argument amongst the military working dog community. You know, our dog handlers that came before us, especially our Vietnam and Korean War vets, uh, were given an animal that saved countless lives, uh, but they were, back in the day, issued their equipment. They're still issued nowadays. Our argument now, and I, I, I think I could speak for many dog handlers, is it's not equipment because it has a heartbeat. Well, we got pulled out in the morning, they told us, get your stuff and be down at such and such a place, and you're loading up and heading out. She knew damn well there was something going on. There was no sense of punishing her or me anymore because I probably wouldn't have been able to handle it. You know the rest of the story. We don't know what happened to the dogs. And that still hurts, you know, from 55 to today. We knew that the dogs were classified as equipment and they would not be able to leave Vietnam. It's probably the most difficult emotional experience you can have with your dog because you're leaving him. We were in the 8th, 8th Army, 54-55. I was 19 years old, that's my dog, Willie. We were at Wee John Boo. But I'm already starting to cry. I can't help it. It's hard. You can't walk with somebody for two years and love them and tell them your life story then walk off and leave them. You can't do it, it's hard. Their bond, sometimes closer than the bond that they had with their fellow soldiers. Oh, he's definitely a partner, our best friend. Well, you were with him, you know, 12 hours a day, pretty much, uh, pretty much the whole year. This represents the dogs that served during the Vietnam War. The inscription down there reads, the service and sacrifice of the dogs that were left behind during the Vietnam War. And uh, I wrote that inscription because it is the first war and the only war that we lost 4,000 dogs that never came home. While some did get out of the war, several hundred were redistributed after we, we shut down the war in 1975, the war was over in Vietnam as far as our country was concerned. But when our troops pulled out, the dogs were left behind. Like all animals, they have the ability to make a conscious decision to flee or to fight. They choose to fight. This alone separates them to the tip of the spear. The thing that people need to understand, and it's hard to describe unless you've been there, is the number of lives saved. And I think Vietnam, they estimated 10,000 service members, I think, was their number. Um, to me, only God knows the answer to how many guys have been saved. But I can tell you it's a lot. I'm alive today because of these dogs. And I think that's the biggest thing people need to understand is in times past and even kind of current day, are they treated as well as they should be? They're a lot better than they were you know, years ago in, in past conflicts. We've taken it to the point where these guys are on our manifest. If we need a medevac helicopter, we can call them in for them. U.S. surgeons treat them, not vets. So, I mean, they've got that full, um, that full care while they're in. But it's that transition process of once they retire, they're kind of like, hey, here's your leash, have a good life. I was responsible for the lives of the people behind me every day, and that dog is what made that responsibility possible. The value of that dog, it, it, it can't be measured. When it comes to the dog's post-retirement, my personal belief in what I'm trying to get done is, if you think about it, we gave them the same privileges we had on the battlefield. We would call medevac in for them. U.S. surgeons would treat them. 
if they had achy zowies, vets would see them, take care of them. They were basically all taken care of. Sure. So to me, it's how do we close that gap where now once post-retirement, we can sit there and have something in place, dog EVA for lack of better terms, to take care of you know our four-legged US service members that took care of us Benno in the beginning was uh, was a tool to me. We grew a bond. We ended up becoming insanely close that when he died, it was it was like a, a piece of me had died. For us not to give them a shred of health care um, is unacceptable. I mean, we spend more money on plastic forks and paper plates than we do retired canines, and that's a fact. These are animals that didn't never ask to do this. They do it for a ball, they do it for a pat on the head. They don't do it for benefits, they don't do it for healthcare, they don't do it for any of that. But what we owe them is we owe them all of that because if all of these dogs were written awards, right? Your, your multi-purpose canines for what they do night in and night out, there would be generals with sore wrists writing silver stars and medal of honor recipient and, and medal of honors for these for these dogs. This is a war dog story giving a voice to the voiceless.